Hello, and welcome to episode 564 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm David Barr Kirtley, author of the book Save Me, Please, and Other Stories. Publishers Weekly says, Visceral settings and robust characters will have readers marveling at how much Kirtley is able to fit into a limited page count. For SFF fans with no time to sink into a doorstopper, these concentrated doses of genre goodness will hit the spot. And Kirkus Reviews writes, Currently employs sharp, concise prose that complements his puckish sense of humor. The author's passionate voice breathes life into this wonderful array of tales. So again, the book is called Save Me, Please, and Other Stories, and it's available now on Amazon.com. And our guest today is Teresa Sutherland. She holds an MFA in film from Florida State University, where she directed the short film The Winter, about a pioneer woman being haunted by an invisible monster. She later adapted the story into the feature film The Wind, directed by Emma Tammy. Teresa has also worked as a staff writer on the Netflix series Midnight Mass, and is the director of the new feature film Lovely Dark and Deep, about a park ranger investigating mysterious disappearances in a national park. I'll also mention that my wife, Steph Grossman, co-host of the Basement Girls Horror Podcast, has a small voice acting role in Lovely Dark and Deep, so everyone should definitely go check that out. All right, so now here's your interview with Teresa Sutherland. All right, so we're here with Teresa Sutherland. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Okay, so how did you first get interested in horror? Um, I have been interested in horror for my entire life. Uh, I have an older sister who you watch, would watch, like, I think Pet Cemetery was the first movie I saw, and she's about seven years older than me. So I like would sneak out into the living room and sit behind them. And so I saw Pet Cemetery way too young. <laughs> um, and that was that the first like of- the first horror movie you saw, or like literally the first movie you saw a horror movie. Okay, I was okay. around seven or eight, I think, which is just way too young <laughs> <laughs> to see that. <laughs> and um, yeah, first horror movie, and it terrified me but also just was so thrilling and interesting and made me feel things that I, of course, as a child, just hadn't really had exposure to before. And and it really kind of just changed my brain, I think. And it it was on from there. Uh, So what were some other horror movies or books or whatever that were big formative influences for you? Um, Shirley Jackson has always been... Uh, huge for my writing and just the way I think about horror. I was introduced to her fairly late. Um, I was in I was in my master's degree when when I first read Haunting of Hill House, and then Hangs Man, and then We Have Always Lived in the Castle, and just could not get enough. Um, uh, and um, all of like the Stephen King mini series that they used to put on tv all the time Mm -hmm. i would i would be like can i watch tv in your room mom because i didn't have my own tv and she'd be like sure so i'd go in there and just like lock the door so nobody could see what i was doing and just like watch rose red or um what was that the tommy knockers or uh all of the storm of the century in any of those mini series that would come on television i was just so excited and different times, right? You'd have to be like, it's commercial break. I have to run to the bathroom mm-hmm. and get back. <laughs> There's no pausing here. Uh, and I, I that those are some of the first like DVD collections I went after when when I started to col- make make my own collection. And so I, I have all of those. But yeah, I, just just anything I could get my hands on, really. Um, so, so if your parents had known, if your parents had known what you were doing, would they have tried to stop you from watching all the the horror stuff? Probably, I think, especially if they had if they had realized what exactly it was. Like, I could I could be like, I'm watching Rose Red. <laughs> and like, oh, okay, that sounds fine. I'm watching Storm of the Century. Oh my, is that like historical? Sounds, like, sounds educational. Okay, <laughs> yeah, it sounds educational. And so like, I, th- I feel like if there had been like any research into that, and then um, my parents divorced. And so like, when I go over to my dad's, we'd go to a crown video and rent stuff uh, in Missouri. And um, I would, 
as long as it was not rated, my dad d- thought that that was fine. <laughs> so <laughs> I got into a lot weirder shit at that time. <laughs> I think I saw a ghost story, uh, which was based off Peter Straub's novel. And yeah, just some really heavy shit. <laughs> So were you thinking at all, like, when did you start thinking that you might want to uh, be a horror filmmaker or, or anything like that? Um, I, I feel like it didn't really take full hold. I'd always like, that was always the genre that I was interested in. Those were the movies I wanted to go see. Like my undergrad was all about theater. Then I kind of discovered filmmaking was something that, pe- that like I could try and went to get my master's because I knew nothing about it. And it was sort of at that time that I was really like working on my own voice and and what I wanted to say. And everything I kept writing kept having this like horror tinge to it or horror themes in it. And at like a graduation, um, I was telling somebody because because my thesis film was a horror film and we were talking about it and I was telling somebody about this other, this other script I'd wrote, which was more magical realism. And they were like, if you like horror, you should really just like own that, really just hold on to that. And And that was probably one of the best pieces of advice I think I've ever received because just like sort of pigeonholing myself into that has opened up so many doors being like, this is what I do. Yeah, well, it seems like horror is a really congenial um, genre for for filmmakers, you know, that there's this dedicated audience, but you can still make things on a more limited budget as opposed to fantasy and science fiction, the other genres we tend to talk about on this podcast, where it's really hard to do stuff without, you know, a lot of special effects and a big budget and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it is very filmmaker friendly or it can can certainly be. I mean, we have our crossovers with sci-fi and all of that, which can get huge. Uh, you can get your event horizons and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But but you can tell a really effective story in horror in a house or in, in one location on, on a prairie, mm-hmm. in a forest, like in, in these sorts of locations and just really like narrow down your scope and and make a story that's exciting for people to to want to see and also exciting for financiers because they can see kind of the the possibility of we don't have to spend gobs of money on this we can make it for a reasonable like normal budget and actually have room to sort of get our money back and invest back into it if we choose to yeah. Well, so when you when you talk about setting a a movie on a prairie that's a if people don't know that's a reference to the your your master's thesis film The Winter, which was then sort of adapted into the feature film The Wind. So, do yeah. you want to talk about how did you um like talk about how did you get the idea to to tell a story set on the prairie? I I'm from uh, Missouri. I lived in Kansas for a while. I've always been kind of very drawn to nature and the land, and at that time. Uh, my husband was working and I was in college and there was this community garden that was really interesting. And so I signed up for it and then I got there and I was in my, maybe, maybe my mid twenties at that point. And it was me and just a bunch of like older women, fifties and older. And I would just listen to them talk and talk. And, and one day we were out there just pulling weeds out of this garden and it was so windy that I couldn't hear anything they said. And finally I was just like, I can't hear you. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm just going to like do this, I guess. Uh, We'll talk in a minute. And we are walking inside and one of them like walks up next to me, puts her arm around me and she's like, you know, it used to drive women crazy. And I was like, what, what did (laughs) she's like the wind, the wind used to drive women crazy. And I just made her tell me everything she knew about that. And when I got home, I was all over it. I bought books, um, started researching and that's where, that's where the winter came from. And then of course the wind. And that's, that's a litter. Is that an urban legend or or is that literally true that? women would go insane from from the winds it the is it is it is true in that probably some truth to to of course like the isolation 
and this like new experience and not really knowing what to do I th- and being alone all the time and constantly being under threat, I think would probably just like snap anybody's mind. I don't know if the wind itself... <laughs> <laughs> but the wind was very was quite windy and, and noted a lot. Was there was, was there a something. control group in this experiment? <laughs> I guess the I guess the people who didn't go, <laughs> the the people who were like, no thanks, I don't need to be a pioneer. <laughs> 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 I'll stay home. <laughs> um, yeah, but the the stories were like, it is something that they thought was happening, and I don't. I don't necessarily know how much truth it is to the wind exactly doing that, but it is very eerie. I'm sure there were like, like it messed with your balance or equal equilibrium at times, like, but it was something that was definitely thought did happen. Uh I was just reading an article where it said for your master's thesis film, the winter that you traveled farther than any FSU student had ever traveled to film their, uh, their film before I did I I did everybody most people at that time had just shot in Florida because that's where FSU is and that's the easiest and honestly the sanest route to take <laughs> and I I had written uh I had the idea and I pitched it we had to pitch it to our professors and my professor was like I don't know where you're going to find that location around here. And I was like, well, I could go to Kansas. And then he just said, okay. And I just wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to be, you know, like, no, we can't take our equipment across state lines (laughs) to other, like several state lines to get to this place. But he said, yes. And so I started researching. I found this incredible museum in Larnard, Kansas, and they had a sod house that they re- reproduced that they built and a wooden like um, a, 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 just like a simple wooden house that they'd also done and a church and kind of set up what a community might kind of look like very close together. And we got there and very much wanted to shoot in the wooden house, which was it's like thinking back so silly. Why would you do that when you've got like a house made of dirt? That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just too small. Like, we just could not fit ourselves into it. Um, and we went to go look at the sod house. And it was just, it was just, it it was larger, incredible. It's made of dirt. It's very, like, textured. It's, it's beautiful in, like, a filmmaking sense. And so we, yeah, we just, like, I got, I was only allowed to have, like, half the crew that the other people had because we were traveling. And, um my budget mostly went to just like gas and putting ourselves up and we just did it. And it feels like such a weird thing to have done then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like why, why not just like make your movie the easiest way? But that's, that's, that's me. (laughs) I guess. (laughs) And I'll just explain, I guess for listeners. So the premise is that there's a, a woman on, you know, sort of a pioneer woman on the prairie and she is being, haunted or you know under threat by some supernatural some sort of invisible supernatural force that is somehow embodied in the wind and and that's sort of the the premise of both the um the short film and the feature and so then kind of how did how did the short film lead then to the feature film version uh i chris allender also who who produced the wind he was also an alum of fsu he had seen my short film at my he was a speaker at my graduation. So he saw my film there and we got to talking there and just like, Oh, I think that's really cool. Thank you. And then I moved out here and years later ended up being an assistant at his company. And one day he's just walking through the building and stops at my desk. And he's like, you know, I've I've thought about your short film for a long time. Do you, like, do you have an idea of how you'd make this into a feature? And I was just like, no, (laughs) no, I don't. (laughs) And then of course, later that day, I was just thinking about it. And I was like, how will I turn this? How would I do that? How would I turn this short film into a feature? And I just like spun it around, spun it around and came to the conclusion that I would just need to take 
kind of the broader idea, take a step back and not try and do this exact story, but step back and and make this kind of story. And that really opened up, of course, possibilities in the world for me. And so after I leaned more into that idea, it took me about a month to write. And I was like, hey, Chris, this is what this is what the future would look like. And he read it. And we were off to the races. We were going, <laughs> um, which is incredible. Like that's an incredible way for any of this to happen. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's a terrific movie. And um, I mean, one thing that was striking to me is I, I watched an interview, and one of the actresses mentioned, "Oh, it was just the five of us, you know, shooting this movie." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess there were only five characters in the whole movie, but it just it seemed like you know it, it created such a sense of place that I sort of in my head subconsciously felt like there must have been more characters than that. But it is just it creates this whole thing with just this very small set of actors." Yeah, I I love that it feels that way. Uh, for me, like the wind is absolutely a character. Like the locations are characters. Like it's the the two houses. Like putting such specificity into those elements kind of fills up the space perhaps that where you might be missing more um and really playing with sound sound is something i am i love so much i i I just really love sound Hmm. and sound design in horror movies is so important it is like i would say possibly 50 if not more percents of the actual horror of the movie it comes from what you're hearing, what you're not hearing, when you're hearing it, the music cues, all of this is just so important to creating that space for us to feel that. I, I just find that to be so exciting and interesting. Yeah. So, so then what was that like then to have a feature film come out that you had written the script for? I mean, there must have been a big, is that really exciting? Was that sort of career changing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when we i i'm 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 always surprised by the industry i did not grow up in the industry or industry adjacent like i said i'm from missouri my mom was a teller at a bank my dad worked at a factory my stepdad was a gas worked at a gas company like i none of my family extended family was even like a part of this so coming here i only knew like story. I just kind of brought story with me. <laughs> just like, this is how I tell stories. And so like when we learned that we'd, we'd been accepted to TIFF, I, I, my first question was like, oh, great. Is that, is that like super good? And everybody was like, yeah, Teresa, that's like super good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Great. And then I get there and like, I'm experiencing this festival and just, just being like, oh, I, I'm seeing like famous people and actors and like, this is a big deal. Oh my God. <laughs> and really overwhelmed in that sense. But I also find that, that that makes it kind of more exciting and also less scary at times. Like I don't always know <laughs> who I'm talking to or what I'm getting into. And so like, I'm, I, I'm more comfortable in a sense of just being myself and just like talking about the stuff that I love. Um, and, and you're, you're sorry, after, you're talking about after, doing, doing interviews and stuff. Like, what do you talk, what do you oh, mean? Just getting like into... when I take, when I take meetings or when I'm like, get it, like a uh, company buys something mine or they're interested in something of mine or I'm partnering with somebody. I just find that I'm like, I, I look them up. I kind of do my general research, but I don't, I don't have the anxiety. I feel like I, I as like my specific type of person (laughs) might have (laughs) had I been like more uh, saturated with it. I'm just kind of like, just, just good old me, just going (laughs) at it, just being myself. Um, And then uh, after, after TIFF, uh, the, the script went around, the, the movie went around, people watched the movie, Mike Flanagan tweeted about the movie And I had a general at his company and um, just talked with with one of the execs there, John. And then after that, um, my reps called and they were like, Mike's doing this TV show. And John asked, he like he had mentioned the wind and John was like, oh, if you like the movie, you really need to read the script. 
And so Mike did. And my reps told me he wanted to meet about possibly like just like this specific project and being a writer on in this room. And so I was like, great. I went and we talked, had a great conversation. And uh, yeah, he he hired me to come in and the, uh, work on Midnight Mass was the project. And um, so then that from being in the room at Midnight Mass, I met Ilan Gale, who's a producer on Lovely Dark and Deep. And so it just kind of feels like it just kind of feels like you I've yes anded my way from one thing to another thing to another thing and really just kind of been like on this specific trajectory that is taking me somewhere. (laughs) And I'm just like, sure, let's do it. Let's go. I guess I'll I'll just explain for listeners, if you don't know Mike Flanagan, he's a, a big deal director, showrunner, and horror. Um, he did the, uh, we reviewed his uh, show, um, The Haunting of Hill House, um, you know, which is sort of loosely based on the Shirley Jackson novel. I mean, it's sort of a, a reimagining of it. Uh, I thought it was absolutely spectacular. Um, yeah. But so when he tweeted about you, did you, were you like, oh my God, Mike Flanagan is tweeting about me? Like, was he someone who was, you know, on your radar at that at that time? Um, I had only really known about Mike from like absentia and uh oculus and I actually didn't I had, I had watched hush I had seen the second Ouija movie but I just didn't clock who made those so I was <laughs> kind of again another another way of like not really fully absorbed in in the business of it all it just gave me the confidence to just have a conversation with a person instead of being interviewed by Mike. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so it it was, it was more like I'm just meeting a a human and we're just talking about something that we both really love. And, and that, that just always helps me to be more open and genuine because I'm not scared. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's great. So, so I guess. Yeah. So, so what was it like working on on Midnight Mass? Were there any sort of um, creative uh, uh, decisions or anything, or moments that um, that stick out in your mind? Um, Midnight Mass was a project that Mike was had been working on for a very long time. It had been like a feature, but he was like he he didn't. It was too long. <laughs> it's like I can't cut this yeah. down. And so it it been with him it was a very personal story and he very he saw clearly like how he wanted the story to go. And I think that's very clear when you watch it. I think the Night Mass is just like Mike is an auteur. It's beautifully done and just so like just so on a track. Just so this is what it is. And being in the room and getting to kind of like fill in the gaps in order to make turn it from like this story that is too big for a feature, but also not nine, nine, ten episodes. I can't remember. Um, That's actually seven, seven, to, I think. Se- okay, seven, <laughs> seven episodes. Um, but not, and being able to like flesh it out and really fill it in and come up with like subplots and interesting things. Um, one of the one of my one of my best contributions to the show. I had just had a a baby and I had just gone through like a very hellish pregnancy. And when Mike's describing to us, like how these vampires work, um, he was saying you get bitten or, or you drink the blood. And then it kind of, the more you drink, the more to like your healthiest, best, like most energetic youngest, like whatever it is, like your peak health, in your whole life, that is where it takes you. It gives you like peak health. And so with that in mind, like having just come off this experience of just being very sick uh, as a pregnant person, um, I, I was, I just kind of threw that out there. I was like, that could be very interesting. Um, if somebody were pregnant and just kind of went through my experience and ask the question, would it then like reabsorb the baby into your body so that 
you would no longer be pregnant so that you could be in your peak, your personal peak physical health. And like everybody just kind of like, like, what are like, what are you, what are you on? What are you thinking about right now? And um, except Mike, Mike was like, yeah, yeah, it would. I'm like, so that kind of started the conversation about Aaron's character. And Aaron was originally, I think he's talked about this many times, supposed to be the one who dies. It was not going to be Riley. Riley was going to be our hero to the end. But after, like, when we started, when we gave her that storyline and started, like, really working through her gradually as the room was going, Aaron just became so interesting and such a, such a hero in and of herself. And, and when we got to that point in the story, I don't, I feel like he just felt like he couldn't kill her anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And so they switched places and, um, Riley dies as it is. And Aaron, Aaron continues and kinds and, and takes over as our hero, uh, which is so exciting to me that, uh, that she, that she does. Um, I, I feel very connected to that character because uh, I, 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 I pitched like her, her most tragic moment <laughs> 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 and it, and it's in there. So that, that's like my most memorable, my biggest contribution sort of um, memory from that, that room and th- that story. Yeah, I guess I'll just explain for listeners. So the, the basic premise is that there's this priest and he's slipping vampire blood into the communion wine, which is causing miraculous rejuvenations among his congregation. And obviously it gets darker from there. But I thought the the character of the priest was so interesting because he's doing uh, some really dark stuff in the show, but he's always so affable and, you know, likable and... um you know, he sounds like a real priest, you know, he, the way he counsels people and he is able to quote the Bible chapter and verse and all this stuff. And I was just wondering kind of what were the, uh, what were the conversations like around that character and, and making him seem so believable as a, you know, as a priest, um, even in this sort of supernatural horror story. Uh, yeah, that, um, the priest is a hundred percent Mike and Mike's experience with Catholicism and religion and um, just kind of getting out, getting that out, I feel like. And Hamish, the actor, did such a fantastic job just embodying that and making him, making you not hate him (laughs) (laughs) from the get go. You're like, I, I like this person. This person's interesting. This person feels genuine. And I think a lot of that is like that genuineness, that like likability is Mike. I think that comes from him. I think that's him working through that part of his life. And I, I think that there, I think that's why that character is just so moving and doesn't like, even though he's started this terrible thing, he doesn't feel like the bad guy. He doesn't, he's, that wasn't, what he was trying to do. That wasn't his intention. He was, he was genuine in what he was trying to accomplish. And it wasn't like overtaking the world or anything like that in a, in an evil sort of sense. And I think that's why that character is so successful is because it's, it, that is filtered through Mike and that is Mike like in a, in a, in just like how, like how he approaches story with like a genuineness and an honesty there and really being because he could have easily come in and just be like like just take a baseball bat to religion in that in that series and he doesn't and I think just being fair I think he was just he's just a fair person (laughs) (laughs) yeah I I think all all of that work is is Mike a hundred percent yeah is he able to quote the Bible the way that Paul and Bev do in the show, or did he do a lot of research, or was there a consultant for that, or or anything like that? Uh, I don't know if they if like there was a consultant off away from us. I we I never saw anybody. Mike 
was very like he was a I know that he was a um I don't I don't know Cathal's very well uh one of the boys <laughs> Like an altar the boy? Boys, yeah, like an altar boy. The boys in the robe. Um, I, he was one of those. I know that some of the stuff in there was from personal experiences. Um, and and I think, yeah, I think that honestly, I don't know this 100%, but I think Mike could quote Bible verses. So, so then is there any more to say about what it was like working on the show, working? Because this was your first, was this your first time collaborating with other writers on a on a project? Yeah, it was. And it, it's, like, I'm primarily a feature writer. That's that's where I feel most at home. That's kind of where I I live in my in my writing journey, directing journey, um, and being able to be on a show was just such like if like there's a lot of pressure that you can put on yourself as a single like a solitary feature writer because you're all by yourself all the time <laughs> like, <you're, laughs> like you've got friends or your spouse who you annoy or whatever who you can be like we please read this draft and tell me if it makes any sense at all and like they will but it's ultimately up to you to make those decisions there's not anybody you can really debate with there's nobody to kind of shoot stuff off of until you get a producer involved or uh, like an exec with you um then those are the people who kind of become your your room in a sense and by that time the script's probably in rewrites and and you're on your way to making it so be at being able to like start where we were with the story with a group of people who were really all just like so talented and so interesting. And just to be in a room where we're just talking about like, what would this person do or what would, what would happen? Or do we kill a dog? (laughs) 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 What, what is that something that we're going to do? We are okay. We're going to do that. Sure. How are we going to do that? Like coming up with these, like having these conversations in a room with people in a very serious manner is just like the best kind of role-playing board not board game whatever like <laughs> D D thing you could do <laughs> right <laughs> um and then yeah you go on your adventure together and then you get to see it later on the screen on on a tv screen or um and that's really cool <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i would equate it to playing dungeons and dragons only then everybody gets to watch it <laughs> have you ever played dungeons and dragons I have played uh, once, I think very frustratingly for the people who were serious. <laughs> uh, I tried very hard. <laughs> it felt like a lot of pressure for a short amount of time. But I do really enjoy like video games and role-playing games, um, like escape rooms. There are some that are online and like we'll invite a group of friends over and we'll just try and get through like those escape room boxes or what, like an online one. And like, I love that shit. I love it. I love storytelling in a way where you get to be like involved in it and figure something out. Um, that's super fun for me. So I, yeah, I'm constantly pitching when I go out uh, horror video game titles, or if something's super interesting in like a role playing game space, or any anything, anything that I that I come across, I'll be like, "Have you seen this thing? <laughs> Let me tell you about it." <laughs> well, I actually I was looking at your Instagram, and there were a couple games that you recommended to people. So like Oxen Free, Until Dawn, or video games, and then a board game called Camp Grizzly. So yeah, yeah, Camp Grizzly is a co op game, and it's yeah, a board tabletop game. Um, I I have a closet full of them. I am very into them right before I got pregnant, had a child, and it will be another 10 years before I get to play any of them again, (laughs) probably. Um, but yeah, Oxen Free, there's a second one I haven't played yet, but it, it was, it's a beautiful horror game and it's so creepy and so strange. There's, um, Until Dawn, which I think most people LA gamers or horror gamer specific community is probably aware of. Um, a recent one that's not on my Instagram is um, 
uh, the quarry, which I just enjoyed the hell out of just like loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love the space where even if it's just like a, what is that? The, where the quick time event game where you're kind of put into the position where you have to do something in this horror space. And it heightens that feeling for me. And that's a feeling, especially having now exposed myself for 20, more than 20 years, 30, 35 years to like horror and just searching for it and, and eating it up anywhere I can find it. You get kind of jaded and you've kind of seen things a couple times. And so horror games is still a space where I can thoroughly creep myself out. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. Okay. So you said that it was, you said, right, someone that you met on Midnight Mass was how the Lovely Dark and Deep came about. Is that right? Could you talk yeah, about that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Elon Gale, who's also a writer in Midnight Mass, has a production company called Quagmire. And while I was in the room, I was like, I just finished the draft. My, like, my team and I were going to take out to pitch. I had gone and shot a proof of concepts which is just like a scene that for anybody who doesn't do this all the time, it's just like a scene or something where you just like shoot it to show that you can basically. And it's, it's supposed to be like a tonal sample. It's supposed to be to have like a, for this specifically like a creepy moment. And so there, you're trying to fit a lot into this. And I had just done that and like edit, ha, edited it together with, Alex Amick did the proof of concept too. And she's also the editor on the movie. And um, I had it and was, was just chatting about it before we started work. And everybody was like, can we see it? And I was like, sure. So we all watched it. And then later after work, uh, maybe even a couple of days later, Elon's like, I'd really like to read that script. And I was like, okay, sure. I'm not precious with anything. You can read that script. <laughs> and he did. And then um, I met with his two partners, Molly Quinn and uh, Matthew Welty. And they were like, we want to make this movie. And I was like, Sh okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Let's make this movie. And so, yeah, uh, it took a couple years. There was a pandemic in the middle of that too. And... Then we really started picking up speed kind of as as the first wave of the pandemic is settling and we're seeing other productions sort of pick back up. We're picking back up our conversations and talking about it and where we would shoot it. And they were pitching this location in New York, which is a very different look than how it looks. Um, but I was like, great, we're going to make this movie in New York. That's great. And then um, – Josh Waller read it, who is another producer in the movie. And he had just opened his company in Portugal. And he was like, I want to send you, we said, great, come work with us. And then he was like, I want to send you some pictures from here. And so he sent just a bunch of like images, research images. And it looked so much like Southern California, which is where I had set the story in the script that we all just, we were like, this is gorgeous. This is beautiful. Okay. So like what, what would it mean to shoot in Portugal? It turns out they have a great tax credit situation to bring um, filmmakers in. And so that made sense budgetary. And so we just shot it in Portugal mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's, yeah. And that's how Elon and Quagmire and then Josh and Woodhead and Stephanie and House of Quest, like everybody just kind of came together and we ended up from like sitting at a table um, in Universal City to making a, a movie, a TV show about vampires to being in Portugal and shooting hmm. in their national parks and making a movie about yeah. national park. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I mean, if if people don't know, the, the premise of the movie is that there's a, a park ranger and she's just sort of starting out her career in this in this park, in this national park. But her secret agenda is that she's looking for her younger sister who, who vanished in this park years prior. And I heard you tell a story like one of the, at least one of the inspirations for it was you went camping with your husband and the, the park was all deserted and it was kind of <laughs> creepy. Could you talk about that? Yeah, uh, I grew up. Um, I grew up 
going camping, it was what, like, it's a cheap way to go on vacations. And always had always felt super safe camping. It always been a, a fun experience. It always been like something that I really enjoyed as a child. And then you grow up and you get married. And I, my husband hadn't gone camping as much, wasn't really like a camping type family. And so I was like, let's go camping together. It's going to be great. You're going to see it. It's gonna <laughs> be great. And so we pack up, we're just like super prepared. And we're like, we're going to go the weekend after Memorial Day, or the, even like a couple days after Memorial Day, we're not going to be there when like everybody's there, we're going to have like a nice peaceful time. And so we drive and we get to this campground and it's immediately a horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> There's just, we're the only people there and like the the campground um caretaker is like creepy old man in arkansas <laughs> <laughs> and he's like you'll have a good time it's just <laughs> and so we're like okay that sounds fun and then we get in and the campground's kind of uh, kind of still messy even from just like the people who were celebrating just a few days ago and so we're like all right like we'll we'll set our tent here and we do we pitch our tents we cook on our we like do our stuff which is a lot harder when it's just two people <laughs> <laughs> than it is when it's an entire family and um so we do our stuff we get our tent our tent pitched and we're we eat dinner and we get in the tent to go to bed and it's very very quiet and, and just so dark and just like already just like spooky vibes and Seth, Seth's fine it's it's we're outside going to sleep and then I start hearing footsteps little footsteps and I was like Elliot wake up wake up there's <laughs> do you hear that he's like I hear that I'm awake I hear that and then we start they're like coming closer and then we start hearing like more and I'm like the fuck is that <laughs> and so like, we're sitting there and we're both just like silent and listening and trying not to move or let anybody know that people are in here or whatever we were thinking we would do and eventually elliot sits up and unzips like the window of the tent a little bit and we both look outside and there are just like uh, like tens 20s of eyes just staring back <laughs> at us and it's just a fuck ton of raccoons and they're scavenging from from the from the parties before but they're surrounding us and i was like is this safe or like can raccoons eat you like we're just having like <laughs> genuine conversations about how afraid of all of these raccoons we should be and w neither one of us slept very well that night it was very it was a very off-putting situation <laughs> And we get up the next morning and it, like we, we paid for a couple nights and I was like, I don't really want to do this anymore. <laughs> like I don't either. And we pack up and leave. And it just like on during that time and that night and on the way home, just thinking about how like how it's just a piece of cloth we're sleeping in. Like it's just basically like we're we're keeping bugs out, if that. Like there's not, like anything could get to us in this tent. And just the idea of that just really stuck with me in my in my storytelling life and in my certainly coming back and like storytelling in the horror space and just really made me super aware of like how we put our trust in like tents or like <laughs> what is that like what are we doing and like even in houses like what are we all doing but you can't go down that road too far or you'll drive yourself crazy so I I knew eventually I wanted to do a story where I got to play with a tent as kind of a set piece yeah you know my family we did a lot of backpacking when I was growing up and so there's a line in the movie where the ranger the sort of senior ranger says Take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. And I'd always heard it as without the kill nothing but time part. So I thought that you had added that just to make it creepier. But I Googled it and it seems like maybe you didn't make that up for the movie that the kill nothing but time is is something that that, that people say in some parks. Yeah. Or... yeah, that's not me. I don't know. I don't know who made that up. Um, but it's sort of the idea of like using that saying came from a sign I saw on a hike like when five, 10 years ago. 
uh, out in California, we were hiking and it's like, take care of the land. One day you'll be a part of it or something like that. And I thought that was super creepy. And, <laughs> and then as a, like that, that sort of stuck with me. It's not, it's not in this movie. It, well, the, like the idea of it is in this movie a lot, but that, that quote I saw wasn't, but it also had me looking into like what other people were saying. And uh, yeah, actually I first saw it with the kill nothing but time. Um, but I, yeah, I was in girl scouts and I'd heard like the take nothing, leave nothing but not heard the kill nothing. But when I was doing research that came up and I was like, well, of course I'm going to use that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so, uh, so how I heard about this movie is that my wife has a small voice acting role in it. Um, <laughs> yes. so I was just curious to hear from your, from your point of view, how did you, uh, get the basement girls involved in, uh, in this movie? Oh yes. The basement girls podcast. Um, they had, they were one of the podcasts that covered the wind and Alex, the editor of the wind and also the editor of lovely dark and deep had been on their podcast talking about the wind and I had listened to it. And Alex is always just so incredible when she talks about what she does and how she does it. She's an incredible editor. It's, it's, if you're interested in editing, you should listen to everything she's ever said. Um, But yeah, so so I had heard the podcast, and uh, Alex and I were in the our her room editing this movie, and we got to the podcast section, and I had kind of mapped out like, oh, here's some from like, I mapped out real pro- podcasts. Something that's really important to me in storytelling is being is like pulling in the real world into my story, so that you can like. Google it and go on a tangent if you want to. And it's not just promotion for a movie. You're actually finding like other people's stuff. Um, and so a lot of the podcasts that I pulled from were like, no, thank you, or didn't answer uh, silence. And so we ended up having to write a lot of it. And as we're doing it, thinking about actors or whatever, and Alex is like, it was Alex's idea. She was like, what if we asked the basement girls to do some of it to, to get their, cause they have like the cadence for it. They have the relationship to talk back and forth with each other and kind of know when to make it sound natural, which is what we're looking for. And so we reached out and they were like, yeah, sure. We, uh, that would be cool. And so <laughs> we, yeah, we just kind of went from there and I wrote, I wrote, what they said and they said it and it's yeah it's in there it's, and it was it was so cool to be able to like bring them in and and bring in real real podcasters in even though I couldn't have like I got one blip of a real show but like I couldn't have a bunch of real shows so I was able to get some real podcasters to do it and that that felt really good yeah yeah, no, it was real. It was real exciting for us. And even in the trailer, you can hear my wife, Steph. You can hear her <laughs> voice even in the trailer. So if people just want to go watch the trailer, they can hear a little bit of her uh, her vocal talents. Um, and I guess just to explain, so there's a, a section in the movie where the the main character is just listening to podcasts, and there's this sort of montage of podcast voices talking about how people go missing in the national parks and are never found, and it's very mysterious, and it must be a conspiracy and stuff like that. So, so to what extent is that based on? like real conspiracy theories and to what extent was that, is that fictionalized? Um, the conspiracy theory is not fictional. It is, uh, widely, I would say widely talked about if, I mean, you could eas- easily, you could find information on it from multiple sources. Um, kind of the biggest voice out there is like the missing 411 stuff. Um, David Politis, who who's behind all of that like his stories are behind all of that he's sort of researching in that space um we got permission to use the cover of one of his books in the movies just as a nod to be like uh i see you sir (laughs) (laughs) um i i i have seen you um and uh yeah it's something that i 
like the website stumble upon stumbled upon in college and was something that very much creeped me out. And then once I had found all I felt like I could on the, on like reading wise, uh, there's YouTube lists out there of like scariest national park missing stories. And there's commentary about it. There's tons of podcasts about it now. Like you could go and just look up national park missing or whatever. If you want to hear like people actually talk about the real stuff that happens, that makes it so interesting and also makes it so creepy and unsettling. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little piece of truth somewhere in there and, and folded it into this, like, here's what I think would be the most interesting (laughs) (laughs) explanation. (laughs) all of that uh, so so then what has it been like having the movie come out and going around promoting it and i don't reading reviews and stuff like that kind of which is what has that been like for you really uh surprisingly pleasant <laughs> i would <laughs> say i'm somebody who's like not expecting i try i try not to expect like too much and so i just just because I don't know, everybody's guarded. Everybody's like, I don't, I don't want to like get my feelings hurt. But people have responded really well to it. It was cool when the trailer came out to see everybody immediately t- like making that connection to Missing Four Hundred One to the National Park story. Like I, you could see in like the trailer comment sections, people talking about that and and realizing immediately that that's what this was. And I thought that was so amazing to like that to to have the audience that I was specifically talking to talking back now uh was very cool to see um yeah and and like even even people who maybe aren't it's not their kind of movie or they don't like it or they just straight up hate it like have said very nice things about the way it was shot and like Rui's work and uh, who's a cinematographer or Shida's work, who's our um, composer. And just to see like the, all the little good pieces that are in it. And it's, it's been very like validating and really, really exciting. Um, And yeah, I, I, I'm so happy that it's out and that it's, like people are finding it in their own ways for their own reasons. I, I heard you say that, um, I think that there was a book, like a real life um, park ranger memoir that you would kind of um, help, had helped inspire the movie. Yeah, there's a book called, there, there are several. I read a bunch because I just, I really wanted to get it, get like their experience in their life as, as close as I could without, without being a park ranger, like <laughs> as, 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 as accurate as I could get it. I, and so, yeah, I, um, there are some articles in out in the outdoor magazine I read with like backcountry ranger specifically, but there was this book called ranger, ranger confidential. And, um, it's by this female park ranger and she's just telling her story of, of, her experience in kind of a very like masculine male dominated industry, which I felt um, a lot. And just hearing her talk about kind of a woman's experience just made, just made like some of the stuff that I feel like other people wouldn't point out she would she would be like okay like i was staying in this this outpost and like it's the middle of nowhere and someone knocks on my door and i'm like that's a ray bradbury story like he does that, <laughs> he does that on a different planet like that's that's fucking terrifying like that's and and like just like not only to get linen right to sort of lean into who this person is but to also get the world as, as right as I could. And having that, that book specifically sticks out. That was a book I told Y and Georgina and um, Nick about. And um, 
just having that like female experience told back was super important to me. Um, I read, I read a bunch, but like that one stuck out because it felt the most, like I felt the most connected to that, to her experiences and her stories. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was like one of my favorite parts of the movie was was just the the life of a ranger. Because you know, like I said, I did so much hiking as a kid, I never really thought about it so much from the ranger's perspective. So just seeing that, you know, even before the the cosmic horror kind of stuff comes in was was interesting to me too. Good. Yeah, it it, it was very important to me to for it to feel like feel like this is how it really feels or this feels possible i guess this feels accurate in some ways <laughs> yeah we're almost out of time but i guess one one other thing i did want to ask you before i let you go is i was looking at your um you know list of books and movies that you recommend and you have my best friend's exorcism by grady hendrix and um grady is a, a steph steph and i are uh, he's a friend of ours from uh, from when we lived in new york and he's been on this podcast a bunch of times so i was just curious if you could talk more about uh grady hendrix's uh oh my god i could talk about grady hendrix all day i am a massive i have no joke read every single grady hendrix book <laughs> um i'm kind of i'm i am a horror literature nerd and anytime anybody asks me for Rex, it's Grady Hendrix, Paul Tremblay, like Shirley Jackson. Like, I just, I, I, I love the way he tells stories. I, I love the hooks of his stories that he's just like, the way into things are so interesting. Um, I, uh, one of my favorite stories of his is horror store and i don't know if and a lot of people have, but it's such a it's such a great concept uh if you it's like, like a haunted story, ikea store I, basically it's a haunted ikea if you want to let grady know i would happily <laughs> take that project on um i'm i would be super excited to do that um but just just a ma like massive fan of the, the ideas and the creativeness i feel like of Stephen Graham Jones is another one. Like he's also, he's, I'm always right there when, when their books come out and always ready to read them. And just the, like, I feel like those two specifically get into some of the wildest <laughs> concepts <laughs> and, and can like follow them in ways that, that feel real in the, in these like weird, like weird and, and interesting worlds can make them feel so grounded and really happening and you're just like this is a haunted ikea that's a puppet we're talking about <laughs> like or on Stephen graham jones side like that's a mannequin <laughs> and like that, like what is going on here <laughs> what are we doing um yeah just definitely I would say my top five favorite. If, if you have not read a Grady Hendrix book, please go and pick one up. <laughs> Hi, I work for Grady Hendrix now. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and uh, actually... No, okay. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and Stephen Graham Jones and Paul Tremblay have both been on the show as well. So if people are curious, they could uh, look back through the archives uh, for that. Yeah, you, sh you should. You should. They're just phenomenal storytellers and... All, like huge inspirations for for me like i i always any in my downtime my husband calls it sponging i think that's his own personal term for what i do <laughs> like when when i'm in between stories or when i'm in between rewrites i just i go and just absorb like horror literature and just try and like put myself find the ones that help me get in the headspace of where I'm supposed to be in the tone space of where I'm supposed to be and kind of helps me like make the mood or helps me do if I'm if I'm trying to like look for a scare like helps me feel out what what I find to be scary and that really helps me get to the next then like overcome the obstacles of like rewrites or new stories where I get stuck. Um, yeah, I think all writers should be avid readers, like all the time. And it it's so important to just like let stories live with you 
in in a really like unhealthy obsessive way <laughs> <laughs> so, to, to, to be in this yeah in in this business in this kind of profession so did you ever send grady a uh, ouija board needlepoint I did. I wasn't going to bring that. I didn't know how nerdy I should come up with it. I sent Grady a Ouija board needlepoint that uh, it's it's a cross stitch. I wish I was as I wish I was talented enough in crafty ways to do needlepoint or or like crocheting, but cross stitch is accessible for me. And I had done a Ouija board cross stitch and I sent it to him and. Uh, he was doing signed copies of my best friend's exorcism when it came out on like the VHS, it came out with the VHS uh, cover and he signed it for me. And I, I got, he, he just like really nice package back. Um, but yeah, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, in, in, I in my research, well. I just typed your name into Facebook. And the first thing that came up was this post uh, from Grady, you know, m- mentioning oh, nice. the, the Ouija board <laughs> needlepoint thing. Yes, I yeah, I am a nerd for horror and a big time one, and yeah, I hope he, I hope, I hope he treasures it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're we're pretty much out of time. So, do you have any other projects you're working on, or do you have any uh, any final thoughts or anything else you want to mention? I do, but I can't talk about them yet, <laughs> and that's a bummer. But yes, uh, other things are coming. Other really exciting things. Um, I like scary stuff. I'm going after some stuff. That's another part of like reading all the time. It is also just part of my job. Um, always looking for IP to adapt, and I've I've found something that I'm very excited about. Um, and uh another original maybe two like yeah things are things are moving and shaking and i hope that it's not too long before you all hear hear about me again <laughs> <laughs> well well yeah definitely looking forward to to what you do next um and so again we've been speaking with teresa sutherland and again her new film is called lovely dark and deep so teresa thank you so much for joining us thank you so much david it was fun and that was her interview So big thanks again to Teresa Sutherland for joining us on the show. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoyed the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 